interesting side. So, so we're going to move on now to the uh, water budgeting section. So John, oh, or Georgina's going to kick it off, and then John's going to write. Okay. All right. Um, great questions, by the way, everyone. Um, it's fascinating to hear what 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 your questions are, and um, keep them coming. So water budgets. Um, there's a big focus on that today. And um, I'm going to try and describe quickly what they are, what they are and, and why we need them and what they're used for. So again, um, as part of the regulations, is the, all that verbiage over there to say you have to do a water budget as part of your groundwater sustainability plan. And basically all it is is an accounting of the total water going in and out of a basin. And uh, it includes groundwater and surface water. They're not just doing the part you can see on top, it's also what's underneath. And that's, that's quite difficult, as you can imagine, because it's, it's, it's more difficult to measure. And then, if there's an in and an out, there's, this, there's a change. If, if, the, if they're not equal, there's a change in storage. So when you hear a change in storage, it, it's referring to change in groundwater in storage. So you, and that's the groundwater levels that we measure in wells, it's, it's giving you an indication of that change in storage. And as part of the GSP, we have to do a, a historical groundwater budget, a current water budget, and a projected water budget. And so the little block diagram you see there is some of the ins and outs of a, um, the inflows and outflows from the basin. And why we need them, um, like I say, they usually it's it's a it's this accounting that you do for the entire basin, and it's based off the hydro conceptual model. So um, you saw a similar diagram. I think uh, John had that, and so um, it's the conceptual model is this image you have in your head, and now the water budget is when you put the numbers to that image and say what all the volumes are, and so we use it to help characterize the basin. It, it helps us to understand how um, inflows and outflows have changed over time, um, given different land use changes, maybe, um, uh, changes in, in climate, and uh, other human activities in the basin. And so this understanding the water budget provides us a foundation for, for management of the system. But it doesn't, uh, groundwater budget is not all you need to do to manage groundwater. You can't, I'm going to show you an example where a localized effect will give you a different result. Uh, in, you know, it could be, a, 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 the basin could be just fine, no undesirable results are happening. If the, and if you change one small thing, you can suddenly have um, undesirable results based off where your wells are. So that's um, an example here that I have. A two, hypothetical basins, the blue blobs are basins, and the, the green dots are wells, and the blue line is a stream. So if you have your wells clustered together near the stream, each of these basins, everything is equal, the inflows and outflows are equal to start with, but on the left-hand side you have um, equal pumping to the right-hand side. You're going to get a, the, the a combined impact of those wells is going to cause more water to flow from the stream into the groundwater uh, or to the, to the wells. If you spread that pumping out, exact same amount of pumping, you can, you'll have much less impact um, or, or no impact. And so the water budget is what an accounting you do for the entire basin, but you do have to do this, you have to be careful because you can have these uh, localized effects that um, the groundwater management that the, the groundwater sustainability plan addresses is site, needs to be site specific as well. And so I think the next workshop that you're going to have, you'll be going into this a lot more. And I'm going to get um, John now to give you um, an idea of what the water budget is for this basin. This Well, I want to assure you that um, my, my other slides will be a little more technical than this. Um, I, I wasn't expecting this on a Saturday morning, you know. I, 
I kind of feel like we're um, defending a PhD dissertation or something. But, um, you know, it, it, analogies are important, um, you know, in understanding scientific principles that are, you know, in worlds that you don't spend your whole life in. Um, and a water budget is a lot like a bank account. I mean, that's what it is. There's money that goes in, there's money that goes out. You know, if your bank account's going down, you're losing money. If your bank account's going up, you're saving money. And it's the same thing with the basin, and it applies um, almost, you know, not uniquely, but, but, but somewhat rarely um, in this basin, where you actually have a contained basin. You know, you just go over the hills here, and you go into the Central Valley, and, you know, their boundaries are rivers. So there's water moving back and forth, and it's, you know, it's impossible. It's not impossible, but it's a lot more hard, difficult to try to, you know, zone, zone in on, on, on the area that you want to conduct your budget in. But it's, this is the concept that, um, you know, we'll, that, that we're trying to achieve in, in that, you know, sustainability is where, um, you know, you, you may lose some money, but you're not going to go broke. And you're going to save some money, but you're never going to, you know, just keep accumulating wealth. You're going to try to manage yourself sustainably so that you can continue on. And that's the concept behind it. Um, now, in the reality of it out there, this is even a very simplified um, con you know, diagram of what the water budget may look like. But rather than like a piggy bank where you just have money going in and out, you know, you're like a more complex business that has you know, multiple sources of revenue, multiple expenditures, and so forth, and you gotta keep track of them. Um, and so when you go out there, you know, you have, you, you have processes that are going on, like rainfall that are recharging the basin. You have streams that are taking the water, either taking groundwater out, putting it into the groundwater, taking it out of the basin, um, and, you know, and so forth. So there's a lot of things that are going on. And one of the important things is that, you know, this is a groundwater sustainability plan. And so you, you can start breaking it apart in that you have things that are going on on land surface that are very important in what's going on beneath the land surface. Um, but then you're, you're ultimately looking at what's going on in the groundwater basin, okay? And so what I wanted to do this morning was, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that, there's a, that this basin does have a model. It has a quantitative tool that puts numbers on these different inflows and outflows. And I just kind of wanted to go through them, and I wanted to accomplish two things. One, I wanted to get you thinking about the different types of inflows and different types of outflows. But I also wanted you to start beginning a sense for, you know, the relative magnitudes. You know, how big is something that's big and how little is something that's small. Um, and just to remember that these are, these are preliminary, okay? And we purposely, we, like, we tried to round to the nearest thousand acre feet. And, you know, I'm, I don't know how comfortable people are with terms like an acre foot. You know, we talk about it all the time, acre foot, acre foot, or, you know, there's cubic feet per day and so forth. Well, an acre foot, if you look at, you know, we had the Super Bowl last weekend. You know, that's if you took a football field and put like nine inches of water on top of it. That's an acre foot of water. Or another way to think about it is, is that it's 900 gallons per day for a year. So you can kind of imagine, you know, 900 milk gallons a day going through the year. That's an acre foot. And so that just gives you kind of a sense for, um, you know, the units we're talking about. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of run through the inflows. And these are the primary inflows. You know, there's the recharge. We've talked about that. There's groundwater inflows, and what that means is that, you know, in, in like these basins I was talking about in the Central Valley, that's a real important part, is the amount of water that's going in and out beneath the subsurface. You know, it's the stuff that we can't see, and it's the hardest to measure. Um, then there's also leakage from surface water, because we talk about base flows and how the groundwater system supports the streams and so forth, but there's also water that leaves those streams and recharges the basin. You know, it goes back and forth and determines where you are in the basin and determines what point in time and season to determine where that water is going. And then finally, there's intentional recharge. And that's where, you know, people do these projects, like somebody mentioned about the gravel quarry, where you're trying to put water purposely back into the ground. Okay, those are like the four primary um, inflows that we'd be looking at. And this is a, a complicated diagram, but what I wanted to get across was that, you know, the, the the complexity of trying to understand what recharge is, because there's a lot of sources, I and mean, people were talking about it, like you know, septic systems, um, impervious layers, you know, the, the, the net movement of water that goes through the soil, and where the, the, the rainfall's falling, and so forth. There's all these things going on. And this is one of the hardest numbers to come up with. Um, in, the, um, in, in the model, the average, over 1985, 2012, the average is 9,000 
acre feet per year, okay? And um, just to give you a sense, there have been other estimates in the basin of 12,000 acre feet per year. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. But that gives you a sense for how much water is being replenished every year, on average, by rainfall. Then leakage from the streams, like I mentioned, um, where you have water percolating from these surface water features, about 6,000 acre feet per year, okay? Then we have groundwater inflows. You can see it's a really small amount. It's about 100 acre feet per year. It's, it's probably does, it's not even measurable probably. Okay, and that's what I was talking about. You're kind of in a contained basin, and that makes it easier to manage because you have much better handle on where these different inflows and outflows, what they are and where they're going. Um, but there's a little picture there that shows, you know, this, um, this um, cross cut where you can see the Santa Margarita, and that's where this water would be flowing, but it'd be beneath the, the land surface. You wouldn't be able to see it. So it's a very small amount. And then finally, there's no significant intentional recharge at this time. Okay, and so when you sum all those inflows up, you get about 15,000 acre feet per year. That's the amount of water on average that you have available in your bank account. Now in terms of outflows, there's, like we've been talking about the well pumping, the water that's being extracted for use. Um, there's evapotranspiration, which is, uses up a lot of water. Um, you know, and look at, look at surrounding the beautiful trees and all the environments and so forth. The water is what supports that. Um, and like I was saying, you know, the water that leaves the streams and goes into the aquifer, well, there's also water that comes back up into the streams and the springs and so forth. And, that come, and that's an outflow from the aquifer. And then finally, there's, there can be groundwater outflow from basin. Just like I said, the water can come in, water can go out to the adjacent areas. And so on average, the wells are about 4,000 acre feet per year. That's how much water is being pulled out of the aquifer. And in that, that um, slide there, you know, we just separated into the shallow wells, which are the Santa Margarita aquifer, and then the deeper wells, and the water that's coming out of the Monterey, the Lompico, Fontano, and Locatelli. Um, and you just kind of see that not only is there, um, you know, there's, there are areas where there are no wells, but there's kind of a, a clustering of where, the, where the, the, the shallow wells are and where the deeper wells are, are, and that's tied to the geology, like Georgina was talking about. So there's a spatial issue there, but about 4,000 acre feet per year comes out from the wells. The seepage to, to the streams and springs, about 11,000 acre feet per year, okay? And then evapotranspiration. I don't know where this picture was. The, the, DW argues this picture, but I put it in here because it, it's pretty and it, it uh, makes you think like you're in the Wizard of Oz or something. But um, it, it, it really does a good job of showing you that what we're talking about here, remember I said this is a budget from the groundwater's perspective. So in terms of evapotranspiration, most of the ET or evapotranspiration in this basin is being consumed by the water that's in the soil. You know, like the, the way I think about it is, um, you know, it's like if you had a potted plant and, um, you know, you take that potted plant and you're, you're always putting water in it and it dries up because the plant's using it for evapotranspiration. Well, the, the, the evapotranspiration is coming from the groundwater. That's like if you took that pot and put it into a bowl, right? And so you can keep watering it. Uh, if you water too much, it'll overflow the bowl. But you can keep watering at the rate the plant uses. But if you don't water it for a week, well, then the plant's going to start sucking up the water from the bowl, right? And so that's what this is talking about. This is the water that the plants that are able to capture and extract the water from the bowl are using. And in that diagram, you can see there's these green arrows that areas that are basically along the streams and the creeks. And that was, um, that was from the, um, I'm gonna have to look at my notes, I always forget, the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they, matched, they mapped out with you know, these GDEs, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so that's the data for this basin. So it's, it's these plants that are, are near surface water features where the water table's shallow and they can tap into it for evapotranspiration. Small amount, about 1,000 acre foot per year, a lot of uncertainty in that number, okay? And then finally, just like the groundwater inflows, the groundwater outflows are really small. That's why I was saying, you know, about the, how the basin is, is some, you know, it's basically contained. And so to sum all those up, you know, we have the well pumping, the evapotranspiration, the seepage, and the groundwater outflows is about 16,000 acre feet per year, okay? So we can take all of our inflows and outflows, and this is a water budget, an accounting of the inflows and outflows, and you come up with 
you know, you had 15,100 acre feet per year inflows, 16,200 acre feet per year of outflows. The net was a storage change on average from 1985 to 2012 of about 1,100 acre feet. Okay? So every, on average, over time, about 1,100 acre feet was taken out of the basin. And if we add the, the time to this, the temporal component, both of these slides are showing how those storage changes occurred over time. The one on the left is using the little bars that are showing where the storage change on an annual basis. And so those bar, the blue bars that are going down, that's when the storage change was, was negative. And then the green bars going up, that's when the storage was positive. So that's when you were putting money in the bank. And you can see that in the beginning, there were mainly blue bars going down. But in the end, you start seeing green and blue, and also years where there were, you can't even see the bars. I can't even see it, and it's in front of me. So it's, things began to, you know, um, I guess level out, so to speak. That's a term I think that's been used here. The, the, um, the plot on the far right, or to your left, I'm sorry, um, it's telling you that same story. What this is, it's adding the storage change each year. So it keeps adding on top of each other. It's called a cumulative change. And again, you can see that it starts out going down because the basin's losing water, but then now it's leveling out. Okay, so, it, so that over time, the storage, the inflows and the outflows have balanced. Um, that may be, that's it. <laughs> I got nervous there and I stopped talking because he was waving there. You're half done, you're half done. <laughs> Makes it my fault. <laughs> yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> yeah, let's give your hands. Give your hands. Okay, I'm going to toggle back and forth for questions between um, Georgina and John and then some of our agency leaders that are going to be down here. So this will be a more uh, geology question for Georgina or John. You guys are still up there, right? Thank you. <laughs> Earlier I was making sure they knew how to move, work the buttons on the, and on the laptop and I was showing the escape button for if they had to move from one screen. I said, that doesn't mean you guys get to escape. Okay, uh, fault lines is boundaries. How are they identified? How is a boundary effect measured? Um, or characterized, and are there cross-fault flows? Okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty technical. Um, so uh, the faults are identified by the U.S. Geological Survey. They've been mapping for decades and decades, and so we get those locations from them. You, you, you know, they can they map them on the ground, and then you can use satellite satellite imagery as well to identify them. Uh, sometimes they're covered up, they use something called geophysics, a way just to measure um, different properties in the rocks using electrical methods usually. But um, more importantly I think is, is how groundwater interacts with these faults. In some cases, um, if you have um, your layers and they were like this and now they're faulted, so so the, the, the syncline, or this basin, is actually a down. Um, it, the, the faults are on either side, and the, the valley is kind of dropped down into that. There's been movement on the outsides up, and then the insides down. And so you have offset of your geological layers. And so that can cause a barrier. So now it, it's not flow, it can't flow right across, because um, you, you get a barrier. Uh, some of the faults, there is, they still allow some movement of water across. You, you, they call the horizontal flow barrier, some of them, and some of them are less so. Um, but uh, you use, the, uh, you use the, the groundwater model, you have to include those in there because the model is trying to uh, simulate the real world, world, so you have to put in those properties. Mid-County Basin, we, um, using the model, kind of identified a fault that was had not been mapped very extensively. And so we actually use the model to help us whether we know you also get a difference in groundwater levels on either side of the fault. That's an easy way to identify that you have a fault as well. And so in Mid County they had this um, and they weren't sure why there was such a difference in groundwater levels but um, they were, because there was no fault mapped there 
And so we worked together with the US Geological Survey and realized there was probably an extension of a fault in that area. Okay, John Theo, um, you say that our basin is defined by two rivers, but where does all the water in the rivers come from within the basin? Well, there's only one river that I'm aware of, okay. San Lorenzo. That's correct. All right. I mean, there are creeks. I'm just reading streams. Okay, okay. So, all right. Nonetheless. Pardon me? I said, nonetheless, I mean, so, so where, does, where does the river in... in it comes from its watershed. So like the San Lorenzo River, actually the watershed goes outside of the basin. Okay. Um, are water diversions of streams considered in water budget calculations by the groundwater agencies? So water diversions from the streams calculated as part of the water budget. Well, yes, it's, 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 it would be, I mean, one of the key parts of it is um, in that calculation of recharge, because in order to, to know, let me say it this way, say you're trying to, to um, estimate the amount of septic flows that are recharging the basin. Well, you have to know how much water is going into the households that's using that water, which is basically not consuming any of it. There's a very small percentage, but most of it is going into the house and then out as sewage. So yeah, you have to track that water. And that, you know, that's what they do. They, they track how much water is being delivered. And then part of the jobs that people like Georgina and I have is then trying to figure out, okay, how much is going into the ground? And then you know, how long does it take to get there? What are the quantities? When does it happen? And so forth. Did you have something? So what John presented was, the ground, was a groundwater budget and um, as part of the GSP we actually have to do a surface water and groundwater budget. So he was really just um, giving you numbers for the, the groundwater component but as part of the GSP there will be all of those numbers. Okay, these are going to be, I'm going to look to some of the water managers to see who would want to field this. These are, these are combined, both questions about private pumpers. So. Um, Regarding de minimis users, are there any charts that show rainfall contributions on a property to groundwater versus the um, same property's well extraction of the water? So basically, is there any analysis of how rainfall percolation um, and addition to the property gets balanced between how much is being extracted? And John Ricker takes the I'll base. take a crack at that one. Um, there is not a chart that does that. I mean, rainfall percolation is really a function of soils and geology and impervious surface. Uh, it doesn't really follow property boundaries or anything. If the, if the property is suitable for recharge, you'll get more recharge. Other properties that may be over, you know, have soils that are not particularly permeable won't have as much recharge. Um, so we haven't really looked at any of that, you know, in terms of uh, based on properties or parcel information. We look at it in terms of the over overall basin, both the pumpage and the, uh, the recharge. Related. Um, the state will require all water agencies to submit annual water budgets and reports. How will private wells and small water companies be required to meet these mandates? Um, right now, the small water systems are required to report their... Um, water usage uh, to both the county and to the state. Um, so we do have that information. That's a relatively new requirement. Uh, we've been able to use that information to, get to better calibrate how much water rural, water rural properties use, because a lot of the small water systems are rural properties, uh, many of them fairly similar to people that are on private wells. So we can take that information and extrapolate that to uh, to private well users, and it, uh, that seems to work fairly well. Um, we do know how many wells are out there. We also know how many developed properties out, are out there, so we use that information to essentially apply an average water use to those properties based on, you know, whether it's a, you know, just a, a, a single family house or whether there's a lot of, uh, say, irrigated agriculture going on on the property. Um, just to clarify one other thing, the first question used the term of de minimis user. The state, uh, Sigma defines a de minimis user as any uh, water use of less than two acre feet per year for domestic use. Uh, so there's two parts of that. One is the domestic use and one is less than two acre feet. 
if we have a, in the county we often have shared water systems, uh, they're, they're not a full on water system, but there may be up to four people on one, four properties on one well. Uh, anything with four or fewer uh, homes on a well is considered a de minimis user at this point. But if somebody's using their water, say for a nursery or for a vineyard or some other uh, non-domestic use, then those those would not be a de minimis user and would be wanting to look at get a better handle on how much water use there is, either just by looking at irrigated acres and type of crop or, or that sort of thing. There's a lot of ways to estimate fairly accurately what the water use is without having to actually install a meter. Okay, um, these are a couple questions for Scotts Valley, so Beth, correct to be here. So how much water is intentionally recharged in Scotts Valley? So I'll let you... So I guess by intentional recharge, um, the, what the supply we have available to do that is um, rainfall, is storm water, because we don't have any access to um, a flowing on surface water sources, and not yet to the recycled water. We do have three systems that are currently being used. Um, one at the transit center in Scotts Valley, a smaller one at the library, and another one at the HOA um, residential development. So we have three systems. Um, they're all relatively new. Um, we have, I believe, the first year, full year, now we are tracking the data, how much is being recharged. And if, don't hold me to it, but I, uh, I think the number I remember is seven million gallons a year that we put back last year. So of course it changes from year to year based on rainfall. It is our most expensive source of, of water, if you think of that, because the projects, um, the, the cost of those projects, you can't just put a basin and say, you know, we'll reach out to you need to treat it because of the, the quality of the water that comes from the pavement uh, needs to be treated before we recharge it. So it's a per, per gallon or per acre foot becomes expensive and we can only do it in certain areas that we saw from Georgina's slides. Not every parcel is suitable for recharge, but we, we keep looking at those and trying to have three. Um, okay, how is, uh, this is going to go back up, up top, uh, how is evapotranspiration um, average determined? The, the, the number that I was showing, um, it's something that comes out of the numerical groundwater flow model, and it's based on a relationship between the depth to water and, um, and, and, and the assumed rate or the estimated rate of, um, of evapotranspiration based on that depth. So what it's really showing you is the relationship between the estimated plant water use and the depth to the water table. What were the causes of the change in storage leveling out in 2005? So um, all of us, every individual used more water um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago just starting with our toilets. They used to be five or six gallons per flush. These days they are less than a gallon. So if you just multiply, multiply that by number of toilets, so that is a big chunk of it. But not only, um, there's a big sector um, that is not existing, existent now. Uh, pumping was private industrial pumping. We had um, sand quarries in Scotts Valley area. And about, I would say, 25, I think there's another chart in the break room, 25% of the total pumping happened um, in, for industrial and commercial purposes. And then both municipal water districts, San Lorenzo and Scotts Valley, we, our total pumping um, was about 40% higher in 80s and 90s. And so we see that trend. Um, locally, we see that trend regionally, nationally, it, it's just, we are, we are much smarter in how we use water. Okay, uh, we are at 11.05, so we're at the break time, so here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. Again, I will keep trying to feed as many questions as I can, and we have a full panel of all presenters that will be ending the day off. So at this time, I'm going to ask you all to please take a break and uh, go uh, help yourself to coffee and the snacks. Uh, 10 minutes, folks, okay? We're going to have to stay on schedule, so 10 minutes. <laughs>